Displacement, velocity, and acceleration in two dimensions is going to be the topic of this lesson. So we've made it now to chapter three, motion in two dimensions. And those pesky things we called vectors back in chapter one are going to rear their ugly heads again uh, and play a prominent role in how we treat motion in two dimensions. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So now that we're treating motion in two dimensions, not just one dimension like in the last chapter, we've got to redefine some things. So when dealing with motion in one dimension, it's fairly customary just to define everything in terms of the X dimension and just say that's the only dimension. And when you get positive values, that refers to direction in the positive X direction and negative values in the negative X direction. But now that's not going to be sufficient. And so now in a two-dimensional world, we're going to be defining it on a Cartesian axis with X and Y. So, but on that Cartesian world, we can't just say positive means positive X and negative means negative X because there's more than just one dimension. In fact, there's not just X and Y, there's every direction in between as well, right? And so instead of defining everything in terms of X where displacement was delta X, now we're gonna define displacement as delta R and it can be directed in any direction in our Cartesian coordinate system. So you'll see it here with no acceleration, you'll see it here analogous equations in terms of uniform acceleration here for displacement delta R every time. But it's not just that as well, we're gonna find out that it's often gonna be convenient to break displacement, velocity, and acceleration into components as well, and to get the x components and the y components. And it turns out all of these equations have analogous versions that apply just to the x dimension and just to the y dimension. So for example, if we were dealing with no acceleration, you could have this generic equation directed in the direction of the velocity and displacement vector, or you could break it up into components and also have delta x equals the x component of the velocity times time and delta y equals the y component of the velocity times time and have those as well. If you were dealing with uniform acceleration, again, you could have these standard versions of it, again, dealing with the displacement in the direction of some vector, or you could have the x component versions and the y component versions. You could have delta x equals the x component of the average velocity times time and delta y equals the average or the y component of the average velocity times time as well. Same thing in analogous versions both for the x and y components as well. And so we're going to be treating the x and the y separately in the next lesson, which is why we kind of got to get ready for that. So all right, we're going to take a look at a velocity vector. It doesn't point purely in the x direction, doesn't point purely in the y direction. It's somewhere in between. And so being somewhere in between, it's going to have both x and y components. And we'll see what we can do with that in just a little bit. So we're going to deal with a series of questions dealing with this velocity vector. It's got a magnitude of 5 meters per second. It's directed at an angle of 53.13 degrees above the x-axis in this case, above the positive x-axis. And that should look a little bit familiar from our treatment of vectors. This is going to be one of those special vector systems where we can get a nice 3, 4, 5 right triangle you might recall. But again, that's going to all fall out from the math anyways. So let's start with our first question here. And the question says, for an object with the above constant velocity vector, what is its displacement after 10 seconds? Well, again, if we're told it's constant velocity, right off that should be cluing in that, oh, no acceleration, and these are the relevant equations here. So, all right, so we want to know the displacement after 10 seconds, and in this case, so we've got the displacement is equal to velocity times time. Velocity magnitude is given as five meters per second, time 10 seconds. And we can see this is gonna work out. Cross off those seconds and five times 10 is 50 meters. But that's just a magnitude. We need a direction associated with this. Well, that direction is gonna be in the same direction as the velocity vector and still be 53.13 degrees. Oh, let's write this correctly. Above the positive X axis. Cool, and there's magnitude and direction. We've defined our displacement vector. All right, second question is gonna be, what would be the X component of its displacement after 10 seconds? All right, so let's draw this out again. So instead of drawing the velocity vector, we're now gonna draw the displacement vector. And this displacement vector points in the same direction, has a magnitude of 50 meters 
and again still 53.13 degrees above the horizontal. Okay, now we want to break this up into the x component, and right after this, we're going to break, you know, I'll be asking for the y component as well. So you might as well get prepared to do both. But the x component is going to be right here. The y component right here forms a right triangle. And you might recall that the x component here, delta x, is going to equal the magnitude of the vector times cosine theta. The y component, which we'll call delta y, is going to equal the magnitude of the vector times the sine of the angle. All right, so let's go ahead and solve these here. So delta x equals 50 meters times the cosine of our angle, 53.13 degrees. Let's let our calculator do the math for us here. And once again, just remind you to have your uh, mode on your calculator set to degrees rather than radians here. So we're going to 50 times cosine of 53.13, and we're going to get 30. So you might have recognized that 53.13 degree angle again from the first lesson. And again, realize that this is going to be an example of a 3, 4, 5 right triangle, which in this case is going to be 30, 40, 50, as we'll see. So, but then we'll do the same thing for delta y. And it's going to be the magnitude again, 50 meters times now the sine of 53.13 degrees. And again, this is going to come out to 40 meters, but we'll definitely let our calculator tell us the answer here. So 50 times the sine of 53.13 is going to be 39.9999, so 40. Once again, for introducing the concept here, I am ignoring sig figs. I don't want to lose the forest through the trees here, but sig figs are still absolutely important. Again, but I think it actually is detracting from the lesson in this kind of a case, so we've got something more important than sig figs going on here. So, all right, so there's our delta y, which is 40 meters, and there's our 30, 40, 50, i.e. a similar triangle to our, 30, uh, our 3, 4, 5. So the x component of the uh, displacement is 30 meters, the y component is 40 meters. And so now I want to go back and say, okay, let's rewind a little bit. So, and what is the x component of the velocity vector? What is the y component of the velocity vector? And then I want to use those to go back and recalculate this x component and this y component as well. All right, so if we do that over here, So once again, so in this case, we'll call this Vx, and it's going to equal the magnitude of the velocity vector times cosine theta. The y component Vy is going to equal the magnitude of the velocity vector times sine theta. And we'll do some plugging and chugging, and let's get a little bit of room here. I don't need that anymore. All right, so in this case, Vx is going to equal 5 meters per second times cosine of 53.13 degrees. So Vy is going to equal 5 meters per second. Actually, I'm going to save that for a little bit. We'll get there. All right, if we work this out, once again, this is going to come out to 3 meters per second, because it's going to be a three, four, five triangle. But if you plug it into your calculator, I guarantee you, it will come out to three meters per second. So now I want to use this velocity to calculate out that x component. And so here, we're now using this version. So delta x equals the x component of the velocity times time. And so in this case, that's that three meters per second times 10 seconds. And we can see that this is definitely going to come out to 30 meters, just like we did up here. So and this is instructive. This is kind of the whole point of this exercise. I want you to realize that we can do the math using just the overall vector and stuff like that, and then split it out into components. Or we can split it out into components first and then do the math and treat the x and y completely separately. It'll work out exactly the same. So and you're like, well, why would we do this, Chad? Here, not a great reason. So, but in the future, we'll find out this is gonna get very helpful in the next lesson we start dealing with like projectile motion things. So but let's get that last half here. So we wanna now find the y component of the velocity and use that to find the y component of the displacement as well. 
And so in this case, we've got uh, Vy equaling five meters per second times the sine 53.13 degrees. And again, that's gonna equal four meters per second. And so delta Y is gonna equal the Y component times time, which in this case is going to be that four meters per second times the time of 10 seconds. And we see it's gonna come out to 40 meters. Cool, just like we set up here, it was, we split it up the vector, uh, sorry, the displacement vector itself into components. Cool, now we could go further and say, well, what if we had these now and we wanted to figure out what the overall displacement was? Well, we'd use the Pythagorean theorem, we'd say 30 squared plus 40 squared. 30 squared is 900, 40 squared is 1600, add them together, you get 2500, take the square root, and you get the magnitude of the resultant vector would be 50 meters. What if we want to find the angle? Well, again, we should know the angle is gonna stay the same as the velocity vector, but if for any reason we didn't, we would take the inverse tangent. So of y over x, in this case, the y component over the x component. And so in this case, in parentheses of 40 divided by 30, the inverse tangent of that. So, and in this case, it comes out to 53.13 degrees. Go figure, just like it should. And again, the big thing is we, we would never have probably done this problem this way. So because it was easier just to deal with the overall vector itself like we did at the beginning. But again, in the future, we're, we're gonna start having more complex situations now where let's say we're dealing with gravity and gravity gives you an acceleration in the y dimension, but not in the x dimension. And we're gonna find out that the x dimension, as long as we're ignoring air resistance, is gonna be at constant velocity. And in the x dimension, we're gonna be dealing with this equation. Whereas in the y dimension, we're gonna be dealing with the y component versions of these equations instead. And we'll have to treat the x and y separately. There'll be no way to actually do the problem otherwise. And so in this example, when we're dealing with constant velocity in the direction of the vector, whether we broke it up into components or not, the math wasn't so bad. But in the f and we could do it either way. But in the future, we're gonna to have to break things up into components and that's how we're gonna to have to mathematically treat things. If you like this lesson and you found it helpful, then go ahead and like the video. Happy studying.